So it's my pleasure uh, this afternoon to uh, introduce Dr. Susanna Cario, who joined the station staff back on October, I'm sorry, April 13th, 2020, as an assistant scientist too. As a note, after signing all the paperwork, she was sent home to work for two months. <laughs> if you remember back then. She also made me a point to say because of the pandemic, she didn't get all of her equipment for 18 months because it was all back ordered. So prior to arriving at the ag station, she trained as a forest ecologist, yay, and pathologist eh, at the University of Helsinki, <laughs> where she received her uh, Bachelor of Science, Master of Science, and Doctorate of Science, where she then focused on heteroblastinion, something like that, root rod and conifers. I can never pronounce Latin. She then became a postdoc uh, research associate at Oregon State University, where she studied septoria leaf spot and stem cankers and poplars, sudden oak death and tan oak, and Swiss needle cast and Douglas fir. Dr. Cario's broad area of research is on urban, uh, sustaining uh, healthy urban and suburban trees and forests and doing that through the lens of tree physiology. She has begun uh, studies uh, examining the impact of uh, metalloid nanoparticles on tree drought stress and the potential of the nanoparticles as a tree care agent, on ecophysiological and um, molecular markers associated with tree stress, part of what I think you're gonna be talking about today, and is planning studies of uh, somatic embryogenesis, I can't pronounce that either, techniques in American chestnut and hardwood, other hardwood species. Today, Dr. Carrier will give a lecture on urban trees, sugar and stress. Let's give her a warm CAS welcome. Thank you very much, Jeff, for the introduction. I'm glad to be here to talk to you about urban trees, uh, sugar and stress. Oh, of course the arrows are not working. What if I click here? Okay. So um, today, this is the outline of my talk, what I'm going to be telling you about. So why all the obsession with urban trees? Why are they so important? They are very important. You will learn why today. Um, and then I'm going to talk to you about little like what kind of role sugar plays in trees and then what kind of uh, role sugar actually plays in stress tolerance of trees and how it can be used to uh, diagnose tree health issues and if it has any potential to be used as a uh, tree health uh, diagnostic tool. First, I want to, of course, acknowledge all the amazing people that I have had the, uh, the uh, privilege to work with during my time here in the station. So I have worked with um, eight amazing intern students and research assistants. And of course, my uh, uh, station collaborators who've been amazing and very supportive and sharing their, you know, insider information and also, you know, sharing their equipment. So thank you very much for everybody here and a special shout out for all my students and interns who have worked with me and helped with me uh, with, the, with the lab work and research. And of course, the funding, I want to acknowledge the two um, parties that have funded part of my work. So the Experiment Station Associates, they sponsored one research assistant position for, me, for my research program last year. So I'm really grateful for that. And also I have a good collaboration going on with the American Chestnut Foundation. They have also covered part of the salary costs for my very talented, amazing research assistants. So in a nutshell, this is, I like to always start with this, um, this comic because it really highlights uh, the situation in urban conditions. Uh, urban conditions are very challenging for trees. So trees, they live in concrete. The air is basically made of cigarettes, but there are really good restaurants. It sort of highlights the situation that the tree is living, but also the situation where humans are living. So it's almost like we are that tree. And to you know, make the, the urban conditions livable, we need trees. So that's why you know, because urban trees, they have a huge impact on our mental and our physical well-being in the urban space. So kind of the one of the take home messages is that we need trees 
where the people are. We need to have trees where the people are. So trees have a huge societal values. Uh, it has been recently estimated that urban forestry and tree care sector in the Midwest and Northeastern uh, states in the US alone uh, employ altogether 375,000 people and they create $17.6 billion in industry output. And it corresponds to a uh, $16 billion uh, dollar payroll. So they definitely have a huge significance for people's income and the revenue that they create for our society. And additionally, uh, they also in return to this invest in return for these investments in the, in urban urban uh, tree healthcare, uh, we get valuable uh, eco ecological services, ecosystem services. So for instance, in Connecticut, urban foresters are managing the air purification, air purification capacity worth of $120 million and a carbon stock that has been estimated to be worth of uh, from half a, half a billion to $3 billion. So we're dealing with a, quite a significant uh, resource, natural resource here. That's just the urban forests. It doesn't include the more rural, rural forests. So what is unique about urban trees is that they intersect with the human developed environment in a very strong way. These are daily interactions and then this uh, really close connection with the urban forest, it also results into daily impacts, both positive and, and negative. And these impacts are long lasting and they span the whole lifespan of a tree. So for instance, um, this tree stump, it's not a tree anymore, but it used to be a magnificent tree. Uh, what happened here, probably, this is actually in a, on, a, on a parking lot. Uh, it's in Hamden. Uh, it, 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 what had usually probably happened is that at some point, this parking lot was paved and that reduced the access of the root system to nutrients and water and oxygen. So this started to you know, gradually deteriorate the condition of the tree. So eventually the tree kind of spiraled down towards, you know, deteriorating health, but then, um, and then the tree eventually fall, fell down. Uh, it might have even caused a power, um, power outage for the nearby buildings if it happened to fall on a power line. So these are the kind of negative impacts that urban trees may have. But on the other hand, this stump is its own small ecosystem. So it hosts a plethora of polypores, even plants, insects, various microbial species. And you know, this brings to me to the next point why urban trees are so important is that 50% of the world's population currently live in cities and urban trees are an Im important connection for people to nature. So that's why the interactions that we have with urban trees uh, are so important. Another thing that this, this stump here, even if it's not a tree anymore, it used to be a tree, but it's still kind of occupying the space. So it's making this urban space more livable for humans. So for instance, you see here in the background, there are these uh, bike racks. So, you know, this stump is preventing the, uh, you know, cars from getting into this space. And it kind of like creates this environment for, for people and pedestrians and cyclists. So in this way also, you know, uh, trees shape the urban environment in a great way. Um, one of the benefits that urban trees offer us is our cooling. So, um, and also, you know, they cool the whole planet through the carbon sequestration. Um, you know, for Connecticut alone, it's estimated to be between like this value of this cooling service is between 0 0.5 to $3 billion. But they also reduce the cooling costs of buildings even by 20 to 30%. And for the US alone, these energy savings um, reach even $5.4 billion. So we're talking about significant uh, values for these ecosystem services that urban trees provide. And also uh, the shading and protection against elements, they make urban areas more habitable. So trees are very important for, you know, uh, livability of urban areas. So that's why we should all be really psyched about urban trees. Um, another thing that's um, valuable for urban trees is their capacity to um, have a positive impact on the air quality in urban environments. The foliage of urban trees captures a lot of air particulate matter 
which improves the air quality. And this eco ecosystem service has been evaluated to be worth of $4.6 billion. I mean, everybody is excited when you talk about money. So, you know, if it's, if it's you know, worth something, then you should be really excited. Like, ooh, how much money, you know, do we have here? How much money are we talking about? $4.6 billion is a lot. Connecticut's share of this is $120 million. And the air purification value, of course, it goes up in areas where you have a lot of people. So, you know, even a one tree in a densely populated area has a more, it has like a more, uh, like a higher value compared to a ru rural area where you have less people, but you may have a lot of trees. So the more densely populated areas like the states in the Northeast and the US, um, the urban tree values are much higher than in the uh, less densely populated areas. Another thing that uh, urban trees do for us, they reduce our stress levels. So this has been estimated by measuring, for instance, morning cortisol levels. And it has been observed that people who have access to green space, uh, they actually have a more like a steep, steeper drop in their cortisol levels compared to people who don't have like a regular access to green space. And even by just looking at trees, you can get benefits uh, for stress reduction. Your heart rate goes down, your blood pressure goes down, and also your salivary amylase levels, which is considered to be some sort of a stress indicator, it also goes down. And especially um, pictures like this that have both trees and water, they're perfect for reducing the stress. These kind of work the best. So when, you know, when I arrived here uh, in New Haven and I saw the uh, Whitney Open like space, I was like, wow, this is a good place to be. Immediately, like, you know, this kind of tranquility, you know, resonated from this place. So I was really excited. I'm still, I'm very excited to be here in New Haven because of the lakes and, and the forests. Um, so in urban, uh, the urban forest in Connecticut, they're actually like, we're doing pretty strong in that sense, like uh, nationally. So um, Connecticut actually takes the first place in the percentage of, of urban tree cover. And we are also the kind of the local leader in urban uh, tree cover in New England. So our um, urban tree cover reaches 62%. And that is also the on nation, nationally, that's the highest uh, urban tree coverage that we have in any, in any state. We also have a lot of people living in urban areas, 88% of the Connecticut, Connecticut population live in urban areas. So the value of these trees uh, is really high for, because you, we have lots of people who need access to the green space. But on the other hand, even though we are the national leader in the urban tree cover, Unfortunately, Connecticut is also the leader in the highest disparity or inequality in, um, in access to um, urban tree canopy. So uh, Bridgeport, uh, and I'm forgetting the name, I think it was Stanford. So there are two census blocks uh, Bridgeport in, in Bridgeport and Stanford where they actually, where, there is, uh, where the difference between urban tree cover is the highest in the whole nation. So it's like, even though we have a lot of urban tree cover, there is still a lot of disparity in the urban tree cover. So it's like the access to uh, urban forest is not equally um, distributed. And also it has been observed uh, that across 5,000 US urban communities with 167 million people, this corresponds to about half of the US population urban canopy cover is lower in the low income areas, which is unfortunate. So, you know, lower people who already have little resources available, they also have less uh, access to the urban green space. Uh, currently what uh, a tool that is used or an index that is used to estimate the uh, access to um, urban green space is the three equity score. Um, so this uh, takes into consideration, um, it's, a, it's a score that varies from zero to 100, and it takes into consideration the existing tree canopy, population density, income levels, employment, surface temperature, data, race, age, and health factors. 
And then highest scores of 100 means that um, the population in the area has equitable access to green space. And the lower the score is, the less access there is to green space in, in a certain area. And this uh, tree equity score helps to guide resources to areas where the trees are most needed. And if you want to learn more about your own town's uh, tree equity score, you can visit the website treeequityscore.org to see if the uh, score is available for your region. Um, one consequence of the urban tree cover disparity is that, uh, for instance, exposure to the urban heat island impacts is higher in the areas with lower tree, uh, lower urban tree canopy cover. And in the US, heat stroke is uh, listed as the number one weather related killer in the US. And it's associated with about 12,000 deaths per year. And for instance, in Baltimore, it has been estimated that the current tree cover in Baltimore, Maryland uh, prevents 543 deaths per year uh, that would otherwise occur because of the urban heat island in fact, Im impacts. This was uh, compared to a scenario where the urban tree cover would be zero, so there would be no trees. So it's, it's a significant reduction in, um, in human deaths and suffering. And unfortunately, with climate change, the urban heat island impacts are going to be amplified in areas where the tree cover is low and where we have low tree equity scores. So we would need to do something about this. So can we just plant one trillion trees and be done with it? Um, this, is, this is actually, there is a, currently there is a campaign going on. Um, where the plan is to plant uh, one trillion trees, I think it's by uh, 2030. Uh, however, um, it's not sufficient if we just plant one trillion trees. Um, the threat is that, oh, we have already planted these trees and we have a perfect plan, you know, because they're the perfect carbon sequestration method. Well, no, not really. Uh, um, we also need to pay attention to um, reduction of emissions on general level and try to strive towards you know, sustainability in all areas of business. And also regarding the tree planting, uh, we are gonna face several issues. And you know, there are some warnings that if professionals are not involved in the tree planting process, we might have issues with, you know, like one thing could, that could happen is that, okay, we plant one trillion Norway maples or something, you know, one tree species, that's really not a good, good idea. But there are some issues like what to plant. Um, this relates to the access of seed material and, you know, stress tolerant cultivars that are suitable for urban environments, but also for forest environments, because we are gonna be dealing with, we have to deal with, um, various stress agents, pathogens, pests, climate change, drought, several things. We have to deal with a lot of things. So we need to have improved and suitable planting material to actually plant these one trillion trees. We can't just go blindly and plant whatever you know comes to mind. Uh, also where to plant. So not all ecosystems are suitable to host trees. We should not just go blindly and plant wherever we want. Uh, we should kind of be mindful of where to plant ecosystems that are or that have historically supported uh, woodland habitats. And then of course, how to plant, that's actually very critical for uh, urban spaces because um, tree planting errors, they often lead to tree death, premature deer tree death. Uh, something that the uh, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change has outlined for strategies for urban areas, how we can mitigate the impacts of climate change uh, by reducing consumption or trying to make the consumption habits more sustainable through reducing carbon dioxide emissions um, by focusing on people-centered urban design. So maybe try and support um, you know, pedestrians and cycling and so forth. Uh, electrification and retrofitting, so try to make the uh, infrastructure more sustainable and, you know, less emissions from um, from fossil fuels. And, and, and one of the most critical components in these plants is storage of carbon within cities and the best technology to store carbon, trees. What else could it be like? And okay, 
uh, that whole report, the, the recent report that was recently published, mentions forests or forestry over 2,000 times. So role of forests and trees in mitigating the impact of climate change and especially carbon sequestration is really significant. But we will have a challenge how to best maintain this green infrastructure in a changing climate and in these challenging conditions and challenging conditions, especially it applies for urban uh, environments. So urban conditions, whenever you plant the trees in urban conditions, you, will gonna, you are gonna have increasing tree stress. Uh, this is also highlighted in, in New Haven area where uh, Jeff and with assistance of a uh, plant health fellows, Justin Alamo, they were surveying trees in 2020. Last time or previous time they were surveyed in 2010. And what the data indicates is that maple mortality in New Haven has increased from 30 to 45%. And what is kind of shocking is that even 75% of young red maples die. And this is a significant increase of 46%. It's not clear what is killing these trees. And it also seems that there is disparity in the tree cover between the neighborhoods. Uh, one uh, explaining factor for this might be that because the uh, tree planting in, in New Haven is request-based. So it might be that people are not aware that they can actually request a tree to be planted in their neighborhood. But another thing is that there is actually kind of like a backlog of um, stumps that haven't been removed. So there is very limited number of locations where new urban trees can actually be planted. And this is sort of like an issue of uh, lack of funding for the urban forestry sector. So there is lots of work to do here, not just planting trillions of trees, um, so I'm trying to be part of the solution. I don't want to be part of the problem. Um, you know, through my research, as you know, probably everybody here is trying to be part of the solutions in their in their own field. So what I, because um, we also need these uh, faster solutions, not just, you know, tree breeding for resilience, but we also need something that we can apply on like a shorter time span. And since the young uh, trees in urban conditions are dying at an alarming rate, I figured that we could try to um, apply something on the trees that might reduce the stress levels. And I chose uh, nanomaterials and wanted to see if they have any potential to be used as uh, tree care agents. And I decided to use chestnuts as a, as a uh, model system for this study, because I also have the ongoing collaboration with the American Chestnut Foundation. And <clears throat> The American Chestnut Foundation is also trying to uh, restore the American chestnut as part of the woodland habitats. And we don't really know much about the drought tolerance of these chestnuts that are going to be planted. Some of them are hybrids. We don't know much about the drought tolerance. So also abiotic stress tolerance is something that needs to be uh, addressed for these restoration programs. So we conducted an experiment in 20 last year, 21, with about 200 chestnut seedlings in greenhouse condition. So we studied the variation of uh, several genotypes, I think it was 10 genotypes eventually. Um, so their variation in uh, drought tolerance. And also we tested the impact of copper oxide nanoparticle application on if it has any impact on, on the drought responses. And previous studies indicate that copper oxide nanoparticles can increase the um, water content of, of certain crop plants, and they can also alleviate um, drought stress in seedlings. So I was curious to see if we would see similar impacts also in chestnuts and in trees. So especially, you know, these, uh, it's not like I'm going to go and spray a whole big tree with nanoparticles but it might give us some sort of a leeway, you know, to mitigate the stressful conditions in the urban sites uh, for plant, when we are planting new trees, newly planted trees, they're kind of, you know, fragile and they don't have the established root system. So I would say that the, the potential of nanoparticles in tree care is mostly focused on younger trees. And this hasn't really been studied that much in trees, and because, you know, the increasing stress because of climate change, we need to have some sort of fast solutions that can support tree health. So it's, it's worth definitely studying. 
So we al allocated the seedlings in this experiment into different treatments, control drought, nano, and then nano drought. And um, then uh, we applied the nanoparticles as a foliar spray and each plant received less than one milligram of the copper oxide nanoparticles. And we monitored the tree growth, uh, leaf fluorescence um, for five weeks in June and July. What we noticed, I'm just going to show you like a snapshot of the data because there was no overall difference between the treatments. But when you start looking at the genotypes separately, then you start seeing some differences or some patterns in the data. So here uh, you see two genotypes, genotype 2 and genotype 15. Um, so genotype 2 seems to benefit from the copper oxide nanoparticle treatment based on the larger leaf area that the um, plants are developing. Whereas genotype 15, uh, there does not seem to be any uh, significant difference between the drought treatment and, for instance, the drought nano treatment. Actually, drought nano plants, they seem to be doing worse than the drought treated plants alone. Um, for leaf area growth, uh, the drought sensitive genotypes seem to benefit from copper oxide nanoparticle treatments. And then, based on leaf fluorescence values, also the drought sensitive um, genotypes seem to have optimal fluorescence values, which indicates higher status for plant health. And another interesting observation that this is very new data and very preliminary, but it seems that the uh, copper oxide nanoparticles may actually change the density of stomata. So I have to thank Lindsay for telling me about this amazing technique to count the stomata. So what we did, we coated the leaves with nail polish and peeled them off with packaging tape. Very cheap, very effective. You can get, you, you know, you get to see cool things if you do this. And we counted the, the number of stomata in five fields of view. And it seems that the, um, the genotype that seems to be um, benefiting from the copper oxide nanoparticle treatment, somehow the uh, nanoparticle treatment stimulates the formation of stomata. So I would say that it's definitely worth exploring whether nanomaterials could alleviate stress in trees. And especially these benefits uh, could be um, seen in urban conditions for smaller trees in the early establishment of the, of the young trees. Uh, it seems that impacts can definitely vary between genotypes and it may cause changes in stomatal density. Uh, one possible explanation is that it may even cause deformation on the leaf, but we would need to know a little bit more about this before this you know, becomes like a large scale. Uh, application in urban tree care. Uh, it would be interesting to see what impacts different dosages or different compounds might have on trees. Um, I'm also planning to work uh, to characterize the molecular uh, mechanisms involved by looking at uh, expression of certain genes. Okay, so next uh, I'm going to talk about sugar and trees and why sugar is so important for trees. Uh, so all plants including trees, they accumulate and store non-structural carbohydrates, which include uh, starch and sugar, various sugar molecules. So these can be seen as, as the snacks of the tree or fuel. So kind of like the situation that it helps the tree to survive over stressful periods of time. And it has been estimated even 8% of a tree's annual budget, its annual carbon budget is stored as sugars and starch. So it's a significant amount of the carbon that the uh, trees assimilate. Um, these are an important energy reserves which offer resilience when photosynthesis is not possible. So for instance, now during the springtime when the trees are initiating their growth and they still don't have the uh, photosynthetic machinery in the, in the leaves, they are very much relying on the stored non-structural carbohydrates for forming the flowers and the new leaf initials. Um, and, you know, one very unique and cool thing about trees, also a little frustrating, is that they're perennial, they're very long-lived, the storages are very critical for the long-term survival, and it also means that establishing any reliable patterns in trees takes a long time. Um, so sugar concentrations in the wood during the spring um, are actually lower uh, than during the um, 
uh, growing season because in no way sugar concentrations are higher during the dormant season than in the growing season and during the spring the sugars are needed for establishing new growth so in this in the um in the springtime the sink is exceeding the source so then all these uh, non-structural carbohydrates are used for establishing the new growth and uh, starch and sugars are higher in deciduous species than in conifers. For instance, in red maple, red oak, and American beech, uh, there's about 24 milligrams per gram of dry weight of uh, wood material. Whereas in red spruce, uh, there is about an Easter hemlock, for instance, the uh, carbons, carbon amount is less than 20 milligrams per uh, gram of wood. And interesting fact, uh, based on carbon dating, the sugar and starch molecules in red maples can be even 11 years old. So sometimes, you know, when trees really need resources for growth, they really need to dig deep into their, you know, root reserves. And, you know, depending how deep the pockets of the tree are, um, how far they can rely on these uh, resources of stored carbon. The more the trees have the sugar, then, you know, typically the better they do. Um, well, in, in sap, because um, sap is a good resource for making uh, syrup, maple syrup. Uh, so that might be also interesting to know. Uh, sugar, sap sugar concentrations vary greatly by species from 0.9% to four, even 4%. So this study was conducted in, in Europe on various tree species. So the winner is uh, sugar maple with about with 4% uh, of sugar in the in the sap, whereas um, hornbeam uh, has only le has less than one percent of sugars in the sap. Uh, what has been noticed is that if the root systems are frozen or the soil uh, that surrounds the root system is frozen really deep, it can reduce the sap sugar levels in 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 sugar maple sap for even two years. So it takes a while for the trees to recover from stressful events and through, you know, restore the normal levels of sugar sap, sap, uh, sap sugar levels. Um, for birch, it has been observed that the larger and the taller the trees are, the more sap they yield. I don't know, I don't remember if the study said if the, um, if the size also correlates with the amount of sugar in the sap. And better yields from birch are just, uh, just before thinning, so yeah. And then towards fall, the carbohydrate concentrations, they start to change. And for instance, in sugar maple, the sugars are positively correlated with peak red pigment expression. Um, so they act as precursors for anthocyanins. So then, you know, towards the fall, the uh, sugar concentration starts to rise again in the non-photosynthetic tissues and also in the photosynthetic tissues. Um, and sugars, they are important, they play an important role in supplying the osmotic control and energy that's needed for, you know, dismounting the, uh, the nutrients uh, from the senescing leaves. And it's also possible that uh, the non-structural carbohydrates can be used as a stress indicator, for instance, as an indicator of nitrogen deficiency. And for instance, in sugar maple, high starch levels in July um, predict earlier development of red pigment. And, and also they are connected to lower nitrogen levels in the leaves. And sugars uh, tend to peak earlier in the fall in nitrogen deficient trees. Okay, how about stress? Uh, so as I said, it's kind of important that trees have enough sugar at their disposal. Uh, it's sort of the fuel that keeps them going. If they run out of fuel, then they're not really going anywhere. Um, so yeah, it's, it's almost as if you would be going for a hike without no, any, no snacks. So, I mean, if you're not convinced that sugar is really important for stress, well, desserts is spelled, you know, it's desserts spelled backward, it's stress. So, you know, when, you know, also like when we are, when we are really stressed, I actually like snacking, I like eating sweet foods. It's like my big brain needs a lot of energy whenever I'm trying to do something. That's the same for the big trees. They also need a lot of sugar and a lot of energy when they're going through difficult stuff in their lives. 
So yeah, sugars in trees, the non-structural carbohydrates, they are actually, they can be seen as tree snacks. Uh, they're stored in the stems, branches, and coarse roots of trees, mature trees. And they are very critical for stress recovery. Um, you know, you can go for a 20 mile hike or a 30 mile hike and not bring any snacks. You won't die, but you're not going to have a good time. And it will take you a much longer time to bounce back from that horrible 30 mile hike. Been there than that. <laughs> I did bring snacks though. <laughs> um, it was much easier with the snacks. So yeah, if you go for a long hike, bring snacks. Trees should also have enough sugar so that they don't, um, so that they will have a good time. A uh, significant portion of the non-structural carbohydrates are stored in the coarse roots. And if these uh, uh, reserves of carbohydrates are depleted, uh, it starts to reduce tree growth. It will start to impact the uptake of nutrients and water negatively. And it also predisposes the root system to freezing. And it actually takes at least two years, two favorable years for the trees to you know, bounce back from the stressful events. Um, however, most of these studies or most of these models that concern non-structural carbohydrates and carbon balance in trees, they have actually been conducted on seedlings. So we would definitely need more uh, data on mature trees and also uh, more data on urban trees so that we can more accurately estimate the carbon storage capacity of urban, urban trees. So something... Um, that's kind of interesting is how drought affects the uh, sugar uh, balance in, in trees. So normally transpiration flow of water, so the transpiration of, of water from leaves drives water transport in trees. Um, so, and then, you know, in transpiration, the water evaporates through the openings called stomata that you see here, it's cool video opening and closing the stomata. Um, so opening and closing, when the, when the stomata are open, it, it creates a tension that sort of pulls the water up from the xylem of the tree and from the soil. And these guard cells, they act as a sort of like a tap that open and close according to the environmental conditions, whether it's safe to open the, open the tap and there is you know, enough water available, then the stomata will open or then the guard cells will open and the transpiration flow keeps going. But then under drought, um, as a first response to drought, when there is not enough water in the soil, the trees actually close the stomata or you know, they close the tap, no more water coming out of the leaves. Uh, in more extreme cases, trees start to shed their leaves. Um, and then of course, closing the stomata, it also prevents the uptake of atmospheric carbon, carbon dioxide. And this uh, prolonged droughts uh, will result in halting the photosynthesis. And then at this point, the trees are really heavily relying on their uh, storages of non-structural carbohydrates. For us, it's the same situation as, we, as if we would be holding our breath we can do it for a while, but it's not really healthy. Eventually we're gonna die. And the same happens to trees. So if they are starved of carbon, I mean, trees are kind of amazing. They can survive a lot of things. They are very resilient, but this is not like an optimal situation for the trees to be suffering from drought. And impacts of drought are also seen in the radial growth of the trees. So we have more narrow uh, growth rings in tree cross sections. Um, and it, it shows that um, the, the lack of carbon reduced the allocation of biomass into the storages, into the wood, which is what we want to happen because of climate change. Uh, we need to, you know, um, mitigate the impacts of climate change by accumulating carbon in the, in the wood. Um, so in drought and drought conditions, um, the most, the, the um, cause of, uh, so the hydraulic failure is, is the cause of drought associated tree death. And in hydraulic failure, the tree loses the capacity to transport water. And this happens when the tension on the water column uh, increases and the water turns into gas. And this forms these uh, embolisms or air bubbles 
which eventually result into cavitation of the water transporting tissues in the trees. And the role of sugars in this picture is that silent functionality uh, can be returned, can be restored to an osmotal, osmo, osmotically driven process. And the more sugar the trees have in their in their fluent cells and in their xylem and in the sap, the less embolism buildup will happen. So sugars also can mitigate the impacts of drought stress in trees. So this is why it's important that the trees maintain a good balance or good level of uh, non-structural carbohydrates uh, through the growing season. So the carbon starvation is, is um, kind of a bad place to be for the trees. Um, flow and transport can be also easily disrupted, especially in urban conditions. You know, these lights, these pretty lights that are wrapped around the tree, this can actually uh, result into disrupting the uh, transport, transport of sugars in the flow. Another thing that's happening here common for urban trees is, are these tree wells. It makes the pavement look nice, but it's not really good for the trees. Um, and this will disrupting the flow and transport disturbs the downward movement of sugar. And there was an experiment that was conducted on mature Eastern white pines. Uh, what they noticed is that they, they uh, manipulated the flow and carbon flow by girdling the trees all around like one inch strip of the flow and was peeled off. And what they notice is that the wood formation, so allocation of carbon to wood formation, the permanent storages of carbon was reduced by 50%. So this kind of um, shows that this disruption of the flow and sugar transport can disturb the storage of carbon, the process of storing carbon. Uh, interestingly, at the same time, the foliar non-structural carbon remains more or less stable. Um, and also in response to root damage. Um, so what happened here in the, in, the, in the white pines that the trees prioritized um, maintaining a balance of the non-structural carbon and they didn't grow that much. They didn't uh, produce that much wood. Same happens with other tree species and also after root damage. So replenishment of the non-structural carbohydrates is prioritized over uh, allocation of carbon into the permanent storages. We would also need longer follow-up studies on these systems because this one study was only done for, it was like they followed the trees only for one growing season. The other one followed the trees for, I think it was two years, but we would still need more like longer term studies to see what actually happens to the trees. So for regarding tree health diagnostics, so how can this, um, uh, how can the carbon balance be used as a diagnostic tool or measuring the carbon status of the tree? Can it be used as a tree health diagnostic tool? So uh, any diagnostic method that can detect tree health and deterioration and predict tree survival would enhance tree health management, especially in urban conditions, because by noticing that the tree is deteriorating, we could apply the treatments in a timely manner. Um, visual signs of tree stress appear typically when the tree is already in a bad shape and possibly beyond repair. For instance, this is the case for maple decline syndrome, which is a common disorder in urban conditions. So we would definitely need something that helps us to detect trees that are uh, not doing so great. And we can either remove those trees if they're not gonna recover, or then we can apply some treatments to keep them alive and you know, improve their condition. Um, if there was a test for dormant trees, uh, it might allow more flexibility for when the testing could be done because sleeping trees won't lie. Metabolic indicators are more stable in the winter months. So this is what you see also with the carbon balance. So non-structural carbohydrates, they are more on the stable high levels during the dormant season. Um, so yeah, if we would use the non-structural carbohydrates as a diagnostic tool, then we would kind of get an estimate like how much snacks or fuel the tree has left and how likely it is to survive. Uh, carbohydrates, the advantage is that they can be monitored around a year and the analysis are relatively cheap to do. And that's why this could be a potential um, stress diagnostic tool. So what do we know? Um, 
non-structural carbohydrate threshold, there have been studies that show that there is um, association with tree survival with certain levels in certain species. Of course, we always have to establish these critical thresholds or these levels for each species separately. But for instance, in oaks, um, in roots, a level of 1.5% of uh, non-structural carbohydrates in dormant trees can be used as a threshold for predicting uh, tree mortality following a severe defoliation event. Um, also in balsam fir and black spruce, uh, the higher the starch concentration is in spring foliage, the more likely that trees are uh, to survive a defoliation um, attack or an insect attack. And also in sugar maple, it has been noticed that um, the sugar levels are lower before bud break compared to healthy maples, you know, if the trees are deteriorating. So there is definitely promise in using non-structural carbohydrates as a stress monitoring tool. Um, as I mentioned earlier, it takes a while for the trees to uh, recover from stressful events. Um, and tree species and severity affect recovery rates. And for instance, Norway maple uh, recovers from stress remarkably well. Norway maple is an invasive spe species. We don't want to really plant too many Norway maples. And of course, it's the one that recovers very well. Damn. Um, so yeah, this year we are planning to actually start a study that will focus on um, measuring the levels of uh, non-structural carbohydrates in, in urban maples in New Haven and in Hartford. Um, so how sweet is the life of urban maples in Connecticut? How much non-structural carbohydrates are in these trees? Um, we're gonna quantify the level of the sugars in the maples, monitor connection of uh, environmental variables to the levels of sugars in the trees. Uh, for instance, we're gonna look at soil and soil conditions and root growth space and urban heat island impacts. Um, and we're going to try and use the non-structural carbohydrates as a stress indicator and identify threshold values that can be used to identify declining trees and to predict tree survival or stress levels. So this is a collaboration of three uh, station scientists and two station depart case, case departments. Um, we also have col arborist collaborators from Hartford and New Haven. And we are currently recruiting a postdoctoral scientist to join the team. Um, so the uh, lead scientists on this, including myself, and then Dr. Lee Whittinghill and Dr. Nubia Suversa from Analytical Chemistry. Um, so some questions that we posed for this project. Does, do urban maples with larger root growth space have higher non-structural carbohydrate levels and lower stress levels? So if the trees have more space to grow a healthy root system, do they also, is it also correlated with higher non-structural carbohydrate levels in the trees? Um, and are non-structural carbohydrate levels of urban maples during dormant season a practical maple decline syndrome indicator? Um, our goal for this project is to study the association of side and tree growth metrics for 240 urban maples um, and identify threshold values for sugars and starch for early detection of urban maple decline or possible uh, stress issues in trees. Um, and we're planning to do several sample collections during the, during the whole year uh, for two years. Um, so yeah, this is kind of like an illustration of what we're gonna do. So some you see here um, in panel A, a tree with a very narrow growth space. And then in the panel, panel B, a tree with a more you know moderate growth space. And then what we're gonna do is see how much impermeable uh, surfaces we have around the tree to estimate the um, urban heat island impacts. Cause this has also been no noticed to negatively impact photosynthesis and stress levels in trees. Uh, we're also going to look at several uh, growth metrics, ecophysiological indicators to evaluate tree condition. Um, another important, interesting aspect of this project would be try and use refractometer readings um, to measure sap sugars. So this could, this has potential to be developed into a portable field assay that possibly tree care, tree healthcare professionals might 
find useful. So if this works, it's easy as one, two, three, and it would be also very fast and cheap. So uh, one step here is to collect the sap. So you can do that with a pressure bomb, or you can just tap a hole in the tree and then collect some sap. And then you would pipette the sample onto a refractometer and then take the reading um, and see what kind of values you get. And then, you know, the whole um, ordeal is to determine which value for the sugar actually indicates stress. So that will be kind of the challenge of this project to determine, to see if we find a pattern. Um, so yeah, we try to identify the threshold values, evaluate the impact of management on the sugar levels in the SAP. And based on these values, we can um, predict tree survival and hopefully prevent damage in urban trees. So take home messages. We are now at the end of the presentation. Thank you for, for holding, with, holding there with me. So we need trees where the people are to improve the resilience of the cities, to improve environmental equity, equity and also, you know, trees belong to everyone. Everyone should have access to a healthy green space in the urban environments. We also need to monitor and care the one trillion trees that we're gonna be planting uh, because healthy trees um, make healthy cities. And I think we need new approaches for maintaining a healthy urban tree canopy. And once again, acknowledgements to my amazing research assistants and colleagues here in the station. And if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Thank you. Um, do you do any research on road salt and other contaminants that are from the roads? So there was a question if I did any uh, research on road contaminants. And yeah, the salt they used to treat the roads in winter? I have not looked at the salt contamination, the impact of salt contamination on tree health, but that would definitely be an interesting topic. Yeah, uh, excellent question. So one question was about if I expect to see a certain sugar molecule to be associated with specific like stress. Um, and then the second question was, how can I tell where the root system actually is? If you have like a, if you're looking at the impact of root growth space on tree health, those are really good questions. Um, I would, for the first part regarding sugar molecules, each tree species has their own specific profile of sugars in the sap. So again, you need information for each species separately to see how the patterns look like and what the sugar dynamics are. And then, you know, based on these samples and this data, then you can kind of start to see the patterns. Yeah. Um, and regarding root growth space, um, that's true that the roots kind of don't respect the boundaries of the pavement or, you know, the tree planting belt that you are allocating for the trees to grow. Um, but I think that at least if you have a lot of impermeable surfaces like asphalt, compared to a situation where you might have like a lawn of a, like a house, then you might expect that the roots are probably growing more on the lawn side than on the impermeable surface side. Um, so yeah, I don't know. It's, that's a good question how to evaluate the, like what is the size of the root system? Yeah, that's, that's really the challenge with trees because they are so big. And <laughs> yeah, so they're, they're definitely, that's a good question. I guess it's just like seeing um, the general patterns in how the growth sites actually look like. And then you might start seeing, you know, if there is a, like a consistent phenomenon happening in certain types of sites. Yeah. 
Doc? So, I have a question about the front yard side of the front yard. Um, I guess it wasn't clear to me why you want to might do something, or is this just through like copper oxide in the park might do something as opposed to different Copper oxide. So there was a question, why copper oxide nanoparticles? So copper is part of the uh, photosynthetic electron transfer chain. So it's part of the photosynthetic machinery. So it might have a benefit for promoting the photosynthesis. Um, and it was just based on like a literature review that copper oxide nanoparticles have been shown to be associated with drought alleviation in other crops. So that's why we chose to focus on copper oxide nanoparticles in this case. So then in that case, it seems like this would be the mechanism by which they would potentially affect the development or drought tolerance of the plant would seem to be probably um, ubiquitous among, or I guess conserved among not only closely related plants, but other, other plant systems that are using this highly conserved Close to close to the pathway that people are talking about, right? So, why would you expect to see a different white when you hypothesize the difference between the observation and the plants that are the same species that should be properly happening? So, there was a question like, how, why would I expect to have differences between, did you say genotypes? And then yeah, you said 10, 10, 10, 10, yeah, 10 or 15. So the thing is this, like I showed those pictures of the stomata. So the stomata density under normal conditions, it's different for each genotype. So there's slight variation. So the stomata are actually the entry point for the copper oxide nanoparticles. So depending on the uh, density of the stomata on the leaves, uh, that might determine how much of the nanoparticles actually are able to enter the, the leaves. And then, you know, if you actually have the impacts that you're looking for. So then I missed, did, did you correlate uh, stomata numbers with? That, did, did I miss that part? Or? Yeah, that was kind of like um, after the fact that we did the experiment. So I would realize that, oh, maybe we should have actually looked at the stomatal density, but we still have the leaf discs in the freezer. So we were able to do this, tape peels from those leaf disc samples. So kind of that was sort of like, a, you know, after doing all the experiments, I realized that, hey, maybe this could be something worth looking at. So, you know, the, and also there is another study that actually has noticed that copper oxide nanoparticles cause deformation of the stomata, and that might actually affect the transpiration flow. So, you know, how much water is lost through the stomata. So it might be actually some sort of a it's toxicity impact. Uh, rather than a positive impact on the photosynthetic processes. So it, it might cause like a deformation of the leaf, which then prevents the, the plant from losing water. So this might also be one potential mechanism of action, how, how the nanoparticles cause these phenotypic responses. Yeah, I almost think mine would be a copper oxides in the chestnuts. So did those two cultivars vary in other uh, aspects? Was, they, was the one that was less resistant to, um, or was more tolerant of the uh, copper, was it more um, drought tolerant than the other one? More drought tolerant, you yeah, say? I mean, were there real differences between those two cultivars? I mean, um, were the differences between the cultivars chestnut cultivars that I showed. So we are really in the beginning of analyzing all this data. There is surprisingly a lot of data and yeah, lots to look at. Um, it seems that there might be a difference in the accumulation of biomass, but I still need to look at the data more carefully to say if the two cultivars or the two genotypes are actually different. Yeah. In my own work with the fusarium root rots, you know, we find that the copper is a real effective Producer of um, polyphenol oxidase enzymes, which are stress induced, stress fighting enzymes, and so forth. And uh, we, we found that the more resistant plants to disease are less responsive to the copper. Mm -hmm. And so we're wondering if, if that, that might be something that maybe there's a real difference in those cultivars and how they respond to other stresses. Yeah. And yeah. secondly, um, 
it seems to me like injections of copper into these bigger trees might is a study that's just screaming to be done, you know, and I didn't know if there's a opportunity to go out there and you know, inoculate 20 trees and, not, and follow another 20 patrols over the next few years. Yeah, a uh, question about trunk injections for nanoparticles, that would definitely be something to look at. Yeah, I think that's a good idea. And one last question, I, I, is there a current explanation for why the sap runs in March when there is no leaves? Um, the reason I asked, that was a question we always used to ask. I used to get asked back you know, when I was going through PhD examinations because there was really no good answer to that then. I just didn't know if there was something else. <laughs> uh, I can actually answer that one. Is sugar maple, well, actually all the maples and the birches have positive uh, root pressure. They actually start pushing up some, and if you ever cut down a tree, as soon as the soil warms up to, I'm guessing, probably about 15 Celsius or so, you just see sap blowing out of the tree. So you start having a positive uh, trigger pressure. It's not that it's being pulled out by transpiration. Mm -hmm. Those are the species where are actually actively pumping water up. It's amazing. Yeah, it must be. I mean, one example of that is for grins and giggles at Cornell, they cut out a bunch of uh, six inch sugar maples. And they actually put basically like the milking machines on top to see how much they can get out. And they had phenomenal sugar yields. I mean, obviously it's one and done, but they have fun. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's what they're going to convert Canada now, a whole bunch of sugar yields. So, okay. no. But they have positive root pressure, which is pushing it up. Go on. Well, uh, actually, uh, Yeah, so there was a question whether the, uh, instead of doing the research on urban maples, um, a more controlled setting would be better. So what has been noticed is that the greenhouse studies don't really, that are done on smaller trees, they don't really correlate with what is happening with the mature trees. So that sort of throws off all the models that we have regarding carbon allocation and how the trees actually work in the field. So, I mean, working with trees is very messy, but it has to be done on actual mature trees to get an idea how the whole tree works as a system to get more reliable estimates on what actually affects tree health in the conditions where the tree grows. So I think uh, there would definitely be value of having like a um, side by side, uncontrolled and then controlled environment. So then, you know, at the end, we could at least say that, yeah, okay, we tried this, and then this is what happened in the control conditions, and then this is what happens in the urban conditions. Yeah, that, that would be a good, good um, approach, definitely. Yeah. Going back to the way back machine document and stuff, back in the 90s, when some of us were trying to get more the environmental stuff in the we would then go back to the 19th century and say, here was a new haven, parks, trees, you know, PhD types that are naturalists. And we couldn't get things to grow. And no one ever asked the question, and this is my question, what about in Hartford, New Haven, I mean, in industrial cities, and what if the land is just so polluted that it's affected the trees? Mm -hmm. Is that a possibility? So there was there's a lot of planting is tried, like, yeah, so there was a question whether urban pollution can play a factor in why the trees are not growing very well. So actually I read a, an article that it has been observed that if there is methane leak from the gas lines to the soil, that causes anoxia for the root systems and that exposes the, the urban trees for increased mortality. So that it's definitely, it's possible, you know, and with the, with the salt as well, 
the the de, um, the de-icing salts they are definitely causing more stress on the on the roots. And you know the soil environment in the urban conditions it doesn't have necessarily the beneficial microbes that the trees need to support the growth of a healthy root system. So definitely the urban soil conditions are a challenge for the trees. Yeah. Um, I was actually just reading about this a little bit. So um, in birch sap, for instance, sometimes there is a lot of lead and usually it, so it's associated with like a certain tree, an old tree that tends to take up more lead. So if you're collecting birch sap for, um, you know, some, you know, food products, you, it's recommended that you mix the birch sap from different trees so that you don't get like a high peak of lead in certain um, batches of sap. Um, but yeah, I don't know if, if, if heavy metals actually do something to trees because trees are usually used for phytoremediation. So it, it doesn't seem to have necessarily that, you know, significant impact on the trees, at least not on the short term, but it might have, if the lead accumulates at sufficient levels, it might also start impacting the, the tree health. I just wanted to say, I have a bunch of data about lead in soils in different neighborhoods in New Haven that I got from the Urban Resources Commission there when I did a fact sheet about lead in soil in New Haven. If you're interested in that, I can send you that. Sure, that sounds great. I'll tell you what, Susanna's going to be here for the next 30 years. So if you have any questions, <laughs> thanks a lot, Susanna. Thank you.